There are numerous times throughout humanity's recording of history that great men have altered the course of history so much that we are unable to fathom the counterfactual. Caesar's crossing of the Rubicon, Bismarck's unification of Germany through blood and iron, and Major General Meade's appointment to command the Army of the Potomac are all instances of this experience. However, what is just as important as revolutionaries, scholars, and saints are the underlying cultural and institutional paradigms that they live beneath. During the governance of the Polish People's Republic, both influential people and institutions determined the fate of the nation, and consequently, its partners in the Warsaw Pact as well. Today, I'm going to be talking about Poland's cultural and institutional paradigms and how one of its institutions, the labor union Solidarity, was just as revolutionary as the men and women that participated in it. Poland has had a rocky relation with its neighbors Germany and Russia. These rocky relations might have made up for the geography Poland was given, flat and featureless. Poland sits atop what geographers call the North European Plain. This plain stretches from northwestern France all the way to the Ural Mountains in Russia. Like the frontier shaped America and the Nile gave rise to Egypt, so too did Poland's geography sculpt its national persona. The flat North European plain makes Poland an incredibly hard place to defend and consequently an easy place to invade. During its history, Poland had deflected invasion either from the east, from Russia, or the west, from Germany. Throughout the centuries, Poland's survival has been determined by a game. The game of how well it can keep Germany divided and how far it could push Russia to the Ural Mountains. By the late 18th century, Poland had lost that game and was partitioned between the German states of Prussia and Austria and the Russian Empire. Then, for over a century, Poland disappeared. Unlike Hungary, which benefited from a slightly elevated position in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, there was no elevated position for Poland. Poland was a land that was shattered and subjugated. During this subjugation, Poles were culturally persecuted. Poles increasingly lost autonomy, rights to local governance and the official use of their language, and Catholicism was shunned in favor of the official state religions. In response to these social persecutions, Poland developed a culture that was incredibly hostile to foreign rulers and influences. During the 19th century, Poland rebelled multiple times against their imperial overlords. Volunteer Polish legions fought on the side of Napoleon against Russia, Prussia, and the Habsburgs. Secret societies were formed in opposition to Russian authoritarian rule, and in 1848, Poland participated in the nationalist revolutions that swept across Europe. However, none of this succeeded. It wasn't until the Treaty of Versailles that Poland reappeared in 1919. The Second Polish Republic finally became its own independent nation state. This brand new independence did not last long. In 1939, Poland had found itself occupied again by one of its rivals, Germany. During the war, the Polish people found themselves persecuted like never before, and a resistance government was set up known as the Polish underground state. This government would continue to fight against the occupiers until 1945, where they found themselves under a whole new type of occupation, this time from Russia. The Polish Senate, its upper house, was abolished and a communist government was installed. Many Polish people were not only upset with the unwanted change in their government, but also the unwanted economic reforms. The economic reforms consisted of greater state involvement in their economy in particular in trade, heavy industry, and finance. Socialization efforts led to worsening conditions for the average Pole, as during the 1970s, their government set wages stagnated and the price of food rose. The failure of these economic reforms led to a lot of hate against the establishment. It looked like, yet again, Poland's tradition of rebellion had to be used against its new communist government. Like most Russian things, Poland wasn't very fond of its new communist government. Surveys of Polish students that were taken during the Warsaw Pact era showed that only 2-3% to of students in Warsaw considered themselves definitely communist. During the Soviet era, communism wasn't necessarily a thing Poles took a liking to, nor was it something that was in any way Polish. Unlike Hungarians who freely elected a communist government in 1920, communism didn't have much of an intellectual basis in Poland. Stalinist communism was at odds with the Polish intelligentsia, 
as well as the average Pole's way of life. Under the People's Republic, Marxists went on anti-religious campaigns, further aggravating the Polish people because of their strong adherence to the Catholic Church. To the Poles, the ideology of communism was the economic and political manifestation of foreign oppression. In other words, Poland's communist government wasn't regarded like the freely elected Second Polish Republic. The People's Republic of Poland was treated like an old foreign German or Russian government. It was resisted. And resisted it was. In 1976, the Workers' Defense Committee, or KOR, was established because of the harsh government crackdown during the June riot over rising food prices. KOR was the first anti-communist civic group not only in Poland, but the whole communist bloc. Its job was to mainly defend workers, as well as distribute banned books from Western authors, such as George Orwell. By 1980, the members of court combined with other political resistance organizations to create a new, broad coalition, Solidarity. What started as a union to protect shipyard workers turned into a revolutionary movement. Solidarity became an organization that wasn't just a trade union or a circle of intellectuals like its predecessors, but an organization that eventually incorporated all political dissidents. Solidarity infiltrated all parts of Polish society and became a broad association of students, intellectuals, associates of the Catholic Church, laborers, and anti-Soviet leftists. This broad base of support, variety of skills, diversity of opinions led to Solidarity's unique structure. It was an organization that didn't act like a rogue NGO, advocating for certain social changes on behalf of a certain population. It was an organization that acted like a rogue government that bargained for radical change on behalf of the whole society. In essence, a labor union for all. Eventually, solidarity was not just popular just across the societal spectrum, but deep within it. Polls taken in Poland throughout the 1980s concluded that about 25% of Poles were supporters of the government, while about 25% were also strong supporters of the opposition. At its height, one quarter of the Polish population were members of solidarity. Since its popularity and activity rivaled the existing legal government, Solidarity, with the help of CIA, Church, and Western Labor Union financing, allowed labor leaders, intellectuals, and politicians to create a social political structure and to have a career outside the existing communist regime. In true free market principle, Solidarity became a competing government. Now you didn't need to join the government and become a communist to make a living and have prestige and power within Polish society. You could just join Solidarity instead. This caused a large brain drain of individuals from the government to Solidarity. When people who were exceptionally skilled in either their profession or in politics chose to join Solidarity, they also chose not to join the government or a legal labor union. Instead of listening to the increasingly exclusive and dogmatic morals and thoughts of the communist government, those who were loyal to Solidarity benefited from expressing morals that contradicted the established order. As the Solidarity movement grew, the Soviet Union became upset with its seditious satellite state. As much as the Polish government tried, containment of the Solidarity movement was not achieved peacefully. The Soviet government grew very dissatisfied with the failures of the Polish politicians, and a consensus was made between the USSR and the Polish United Workers' Party there would be martial law. In 1981, the Minister of Defense, Wojciech Jaroleski, was chosen to lead Poland. Martial law was established in order to suppress solidarity as the union was legally suspended and thousands of its leaders were arrested and imprisoned. Censorship was expanded and the military personnel patrolled the streets. However, the arrest and suspension did not dent solidarity's fever. Even though it was made illegal, Solidarity paradoxically flourished underground. Laborers started major strikes in Silesia and Gdansk, and eventually strikes around the country led to violence and death. Because of these atrocities, popular support rose for Solidarity outside the Iron Curtain. Political organizers such as the Polish Solidarity Campaign in Britain formed in reaction to the abuses and the U.S. 
imposed sanctions on Poland while the CIA and Church funded and sent supplies to Solidarity. Solidarity's structure, its wide range of support, and help from the Church and foreign institutions allowed it not only to survive, but to emerge from martial law stronger than before. It eventually obtained 10 million members, over three times the size of the ruling Polish United Workers' Party, and it was by far the biggest institution in Poland. When martial law was lifted in 1983, Solidarity continued to work as an underground institution, biding time and continuing to gain support from the CIA in terms of training, propaganda, money, and organizational help. By the late 80s, Solidarity gained sufficient power, and in 1988, a general strike of coal miners, dock workers, and steel workers forced the government to recognize Solidarity and engage in talks. By 1989, Solidarity and the Polish government entered what is now called the Round Table Talks. During the talks, Solidarity, led by Lech Walesa, as well as other opposition leaders, successfully bargained the government for free elections in Poland, which Walesa won in 1990. They were the first free elections in a Soviet bloc country, but they wouldn't be the last. In the coming years, the wave of anti-communist sentiment that started with Solidarity led to the downfall of all the Soviet imposed regimes in Central and Eastern Europe. Solidarity was a union like no other. It was the first and only workers' revolution that not only succeeded, but ironically, overthrew a communist regime. Solidarity was an organization that only could have succeeded in a nation like Poland. The revolutionary success that Solidarity enjoyed can be contributed to three main things. Poland's history, its international support, and its self-limitation. First, Poland's subjugation and subversive history formed a tradition that was much more helpful in creating a grassroots organization than a nation that historically had a monarchy and dictatorship such as Romania, or even a fully free democracy such as interwar Czechoslovakia. The idea of democratic nationalism was a very mature concept in Poland, which allowed for politically minded committees to form and the constant subjugation of these committees and cultural institutions, how to fight suppression from above. Communism, which was at total odds with Polish society, meant a capable and exuberant resistance. Second, the international support that Solidarity garnered because of its population size, position on the map, and Catholic social values helped to strengthen it more than it would have become strong on its own. Help from international community, including funding from the CIA, strategic sanctions, and especially anti-communist and dictatorial rhetoric from the new Polish Pope John Paul II only sought to bolster the resolve of Solidarity and its strength within Poland. But the most important factor was the third. Solidarity was a self-limiting revolution and Jaroleski's dictatorship was a self-limiting dictatorship. In response to growing violence from the opposition, Lech Wałęsa warned not to usurp or attack legal institutions, but to create your own committees. This policy of strategic nonviolence allowed solidarity to gain legitimacy at home and abroad. Any violence that would be used against Solidarity would be seen as illegitimate as it denied the peaceful will of the Polish people. On the other side of the coin, Jaroleski's dictatorship was a self-limiting dictatorship. Although the gangsters that were in charge of the Polish United Workers' Party did not shy away from violence, the use of violence was not absolute. Although the heads of the party were fearful of the consequences of violence, Jaroleski's camp was not the hardliners within the Communist Party and chose a policy route that did not lead to the destruction of the society. States like the People's Republic of China and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea are more structurally sound because of their leaders' willingness to use mass violence and to ensure the party's survival. In that respect, Poland was very lucky. If Solidarity or the United Workers' Party were both more confrontational, it would be unclear about how events would have turned out. Solidarity's effect on how we understand civil society is revolutionary. With Solidarity, civil society is now seen as a tool that can not only be used to change the state, but a tool that can be in complete opposition and devoid of the adherence of state dictates. 
In essence, civil society can be a form of governmental apparatus itself. The arguments that I used in this video and my video on Hungarian civil society are from Jania Frenzel Zagorska, a Polish sociologist and a participant in the opposition to Poland's communist state. Her work, Civil Society in Poland and Hungary, has changed the way I understand the democratic process, Republican ideals, and my worth as a human being in society. This series on civil society was supposed to end with this video. However, by rediscovering Zagorska's work, I feel that I must remain studying and writing on civil society in the future. From the American Republic to Saddam's Iraq, I will show how civil society comes about, becomes repressed, and continues to exist. This has been The 10,000. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please make sure to like and subscribe. If you have any comment or critique, be sure to put it in the comment section.